Well, this evening, we are blessed to have as our speaker, Sister Madeline Grace. Sister Grace is a member of the Congregation of the Incarnate Word and Blessed Sacrament. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Social Science from the University of Houston. She did not tell me what year that was. <laughs> she earned a Master of Arts degree in Theology from St. Mary's University in San Antonio. She then went on for her PhD in Historical Theology, which she obtained at St. Louis University. She is currently Associate Professor at the University of St. Thomas. She uh, served as Chair of the Department for many years, and she now holds the Endowed Chair in Theology, the Scanlon Chair. Her area of specialization is church history, early church, but she also has a very keen interest in spirituality and, as we will see this evening, liturgy. The presentation that Sister Madeline will be uh, delivering for us this evening was originally given in January of 2008 at a conference for the Society of Catholic Liturgy at the Josephinum in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, a pontifical seminary. At that time, she entitled it Benedict XVI and the Sacred Liturgy. This evening, she has entitled it a liturg uh, Facing East a liturgical practice that needs revisiting, question mark. Sister Madeline. Thank you so much. Uh, several years ago, uh, in 08, as you know, Benedict had just come uh, to the papacy and had written extensively in regard to the liturgy. And one topic which has interested him for a number of years is uh, that of Facing East. Uh, the conference that I attended, uh, the entire conference, was centered around the liturgical theology of Benedict. And so it's certainly worth taking a bit of time this evening to look at what he has to say in this regard. Benedict XVI, and looking back on Christian tradition, points out that Christians find Christ in the symbol of the rising sun. This is an indication of a Christology defined eschatologically. Praying toward the east means that we go to meet the coming Christ. The liturgy, turned toward the east, affects entry in procession toward the new heaven and the new earth. It is the prayer of the pilgrim in hope. As we look at the early church, and even during the uh, time of Judaism, we see a tremendous amount of evidence of facing the East in prayer. M.J. Morton illustrates through archeological excavations that orientation as a liturgical principle has its roots in Christian origins and also in Israel. If we think of the house church, which would dominate the liturgical scene during the time of persecution. And it is found within the pre-Nicene period, or at the time period prior to 325. Uh, the celebration of the Eucharist was in the largest room of the house. There was a platform at the end of the room, which would have been the focal point of the room where the bishop stood or the bishop sat. And it was always at the eastern end of the room uh, that the liturgy was celebrated. This document, the Didascalia Apostolorum, is a very, very early piece coming from the early part of the third century. It, it, it is, we believe, Syriac in origin. And the official title, The Catholic Teaching of the Twelve Apostles and Holy Disciples of Our Redeemer. You notice it says, for the presbyters, let there be a sign, a place, in the eastern part of the house, and let the bishop's throne be set in their midst, and let the presbyters sit with him. And again, 
Let the layman sit in another part of the house toward the east, for it is required that you pray toward the east as knowing that which is written, give ye glory to God who rideth upon the heaven of heavens toward the east, as we see taken from Psalm 67. In a certain sense, uh, these early, very early liturgies give us a kind of picture that we might find in the book of Revelations as we recall some of the scenes uh, which are found there. Here we have the remains of what was considered to be a house church, as we see, found in an ancient city within Syria. We know as we look at the Jewish tradition that the synagogue also faced east. As far as the origin of the synagogue is concerned, we normally think of an assembly place uh, for prayer, uh, for learning the law. It may have gone back as early as the time of the Babylonian captivity, meaning the sixth century prior to Christ, when the Jews were not able to go to the temple in Jerusalem uh, for worship or for sacrifice. We might remember that the synagogue did not entail the offering of sacrifice that was strictly found in the temple. Here we find the remains of a synagogue in Capernaum. We might remember from uh, the scriptures that Christ, of course, went to the synagogue. And so as we look at Luke 4, 16, he came to Nazareth where he had grown up and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. We recall also from the Acts of the Apostles and the letters of Paul that Paul would always go to the synagogue first and when he was not well received, which was quite often, then he would go and preach to the Gentiles. So as it says, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and condemn yourselves as unworthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. This is a, a drawing of a synagogue, but not an early one, but you will note the place of the ark, and that is meant to signify moving east. And we note also some of the important elements that we find here, uh, the menorah, the seven branch can candlestick, and likewise the eternal light. But for the Jews, it was always the ark uh, which faced east, naturally what we think of as uh, their copy of the Ten Commandments. And so as we look at some scale models of early synagogues, uh, you will note here uh, that we have the ark uh, facing Jerusalem, uh, the veil, uh, the menorah, the seven branch candlestick, and then right in the center, the bima or the platform uh, where the rabbi would speak from, and following that, the seats. Uh, the seating or the arrangement gets changed a little bit as we move across in the, the uh, diagrams, but all have the similarity of facing east. In the first drawing, we note that the door actually opens out to the east, uh, which would be for us a rather unusual phenomenon. Moving to Syria in an early Syrian church, uh, we might remember that uh, Syria was a site of very early Christianity. We recall in the Acts of the Apostles that Stephen was stoned to death. And after he was stoned to death, a lot of Christians hightailed it out of Jerusalem because they were worried about their skin. And so they went to Antioch. And we recall in chapter 13 of the Acts of the Apostles, it says that Peter went to another place. And Christian tradition says that he was the first bishop of Antioch. And so again, uh, we look now at an early Syrian church, and you will note it is so early that it even has mention of the ark. But we find the altar uh, uh, in the area of what we would call the apse, or the curved region. And then as we see in the center, uh, the lecterns, uh, the bima, the raised platform uh, that we would think of in reference to the priest. And then we see the seats in reference to the other end. And so specifically, everyone again faces east. So and so as some of our archeologists have begun to look uh, in this area, 
uh, many of them would say it was physically impossible for the celebrant to have stood anywhere but on the west side of the altar and then facing east. So it is quite probable that the uh, celebrant with the clergy proceeded from the apse into the nave to the altar and therefore faced east. The models for an interior arrangement uh, we can see here. One of the oldest uh, churches in Christian tradition and the first to have been uh, built by Constantine was St. John Lateran. Uh, it went up in the year 318 and if you look at the directions below you will see that it faces east. Again it sounds unusual for us because apparently the the facing east is facing the door uh, but we have seen already that there are quite a few models for facing east but likewise facing the do door. I understand that St. Paul outside the wall also faces east, but St. Peter's would be an exception uh, because it was a church built on top of the tomb of St. Peter's. Likewise, as we review the time of antiquity, we see a number of early authors who not only believed but professed and taught that we should pray facing the east. So as we note, uh, Tertullian pointed out that facing toward the Eastern prayer was so evident for liturgy and in the home that it needed no justification. Justin, in referencing the Psalms, specifically Psalm 72, verse 17, in his dialogue with Trypho, connects the rising sun with the East. He further interprets uh, Zechariah 6.12 as stating, the East is his name. Clement of Alexandria connects facing east with the day of birth and the rising of the sun. And since the east symbolizes the day of birth and it is from thence that the light spreads, after it has first shown out of darkness and from thence that the day of the knowledge of truth dawned like the sun upon those who were lying in ignorance, Therefore, our prayers are directed toward the rise of dawn. It was for this reason that the most ancient temples looked toward the west in order that they who stood facing the images might be taught to turn eastwards. Let my prayer ascend up as incense before thee. Lifting up my hands by, by an evening sacrifice is the language of the Psalms. In a certain sense, Clement uh, could be echoing Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter four, verse six. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to bring to light the knowledge of the glory of God on the face of Jesus. Melito of Sardis describes Christ as a son of uprising, who rose alone as a son out of heaven. Origen, in his treatise on prayer, is more explicit in his explanation for facing east. It should be immediately clear that the direction of the rising sun obviously indicates that we ought to pray inclining in that direction, an act which symbolizes a soul looking towards where the true light rises. The east takes precedence over the other cardinal points of north, south, and west as it is given by nature. Thus the early church retain the practice of facing east as found in the Old Testament. The Garden of Eden or the terrestrial paradise lay in the east as we find in Genesis 2.8. They believe that Christ's ascension as we move toward the New Testament had taken place in the east and thus the coming of the Son of Man is placed in the east, Matthew 24.27. Uh, Augustine of Hippo in his apologetical works corrects the Manichees for their worship of the sun and moon. He reminds us that every creature of God is good, but worship is forbidden. St. Augustine further clarifies in his Sermon on the Mount that whenever they stand for prayer and liturgy, they face the east, where the sun of the heavens begins. It is done so that the mind may be admonished to turn toward God, while its body is turned toward a heavenly body. The mystagogical catechesis of the fourth century reveals that the catechumen toward, turned toward the west 
to renounce Satan, and then performed a bodily conversion in turning toward the east, giving oneself over to Christ. Within the canon of Hippolytus, an Egyptian adaptation of the apostolic tradition, the rite states that the individual should first turn toward the west, which is considered the direction of darkness, as this is the site of the setting sun, and renounce sa Satan. I renounce thee, Satan, and all thy following. Afterwards, he turns toward the east, which is the direction of the sunrise, the direction of Christ, and cry out, I believe and bow before thee and all thy servants, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The same procedure is seen in the West as Ambrose of Milan has the candidate face the West, respond to questions where he renounces Satan, and then turn to the East. As he describes the procedure himself, having entered, therefore, that you might recognize your adversary, whom you think you should renounce to his face, you turn toward the East, for he who renounces the devil turns toward Christ, renounces him by a direct glance. St. John Damascene actually summarizes the thinking of the ancients in this regard in his work on the Orthodox faith. When the Lord was crucified, he looked toward the west, and so we worship gazing toward him. And when he was taken up, he ascended to the east, and the apostles worshiped him. And thus he shall come in the same way as that it, they had seen him going into heaven, as the Lord himself said. As lightning comes out of the east and appeareth even in the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And so while we are awaiting him, we worship toward the east. The notion that Christ faced the west probably comes from Luke's gospel as darkness is seen with the death of Christ. While praying toward the east is a firm practice among the ancients, one can also find argument for it among the medievalist, as seen in Aquinas' Summa. He notes in his Summa Theologica that there is a certain fittingness in adoring toward the east, for the divine, divine majesty is indicated in the movement of the heavens, which is from the east. Further, paradise is thought to have been situated in the east. Thirdly, Christ is the light of the world and comes from the Orient, Zechariah 6, 12. It is well to point out that Vatican II, specifically Sacrosanctum Concilium, or the Constitution on the Liturgy, did not mandate the celebration of Mass facing the people. In fact, the revised Missal of St. Pius V was never abrogated. Thus, it is still very much with us today. The liturgical renewal of Vatican II did, however, bring about the positioning of the altar in such a way that the priest faces the people, bringing with it, it, within it the new idea of the essence of a liturgy, the liturgy as a communal meal. As Cardinal Ratzinger, now Benedict XVI, has stated, this idea is drawn from a misunderstanding of the significance of the Roman Basilica and the positioning of the altar and the representation of the Last Supper. Drawing upon the research of Father Louis Boyer, nowhere in Christian antiquity could have arisen the idea of having to face the people to preside at a meal. The communal character of a meal was emphasized just by the opposite disposition, the fact that all the participants were on the same side of the table. The use of a square or round table is a medieval idea as found with King Arthur and the Knights. The notion of an altar facing the people is purely modern. One may discover that in the missals of the 16th century, the priest was ordered to turn toward the people versus populum to say Dominus Viviscum. In noting a phrase so often used in reference to Vatican II, changes in the liturgy, that is full and conscious participation, Father Boyer clarifies that one must not confuse participation with observing what is taking place. As he states, either you look at somebody doing something for you instead of you or you do it with, or you do it with him. You can't do both at the same time. In his apostolic exhortation, Sacramentum Caritatis, Benedict clarifies 
that active participation must be understood in more substantial terms. On the basis of a greater awareness of the mystery being celebrated and its relationship to daily life. In further consideration of active particip participation of the faithful, constant conversion needs to be a part of the lives of the faithful. One cannot approach the altar without an examination of one's life. Recollection and silence before the beginning of the liturgy, fasting, sacramental confession, are all part of a heart reconciled to God which makes genuine participation possible. Moreover, there can be no active participation in the sacred mysteries unless there is also an effort to participate actively in the church as a whole, inclusive of a missionary commitment to bring Christ's love into the life of society. Full participation takes place when the faithful approach the altar to receive the Eucharist. When this is not possible, a desire for full communion with Christ can be cultivated through the practice of spiritual communion. Christian antiquity well understood that what was said was said in the name of all. It was only in medieval times that the clergy looked upon celebrating the liturgy for the faithful rather than with them. This brought about what Benedict called the distance clerical sanctuary. The altar facing the people seems therefore to have been the effect and cause of a substitution of a clerical celebration for a corporate worship. Yet the change following Vatican II, that is the priest facing the people, finds provision but no dictate within the liturgical documents themselves. In fact, as Father Boyer explains, the instruction never says nor implies in any way that is necessarily everywhere and always the best possible form of celebration. Father Boyer sees three focuses of the celebration, the communion of the word, the altar around which all are to be gathered as the effect of their response to the word, and the parousia toward which they are finally to be oriented. It is important that this worshiping community remain open to the saints in heaven, all the other Christian communities, and the world itself. Therefore, a circular building with the people gathered around a central single focus would tend to create a community closed in upon itself. It is important to bear in mind that the community is on a common pilgrimage of reaching the heavenly city, the eschatological emphasis in every Eucharist. What is therefore desired is an organization of the building which leads toward the altar but points beyond it. Having the priest face the people emphasizes the separation between the clergy and the laity. The altar becomes a formidable barrier. Therefore, the priest standing on the same side as the people, as the visible leader of the whole body, is seen as the better practice. Worship of its nature is directed towards God. As Father Romano Gardini has reminded us, in the liturgy, man is no longer concerned with himself. His gaze is directed towards God. The liturgy means that the soul exists in God's presence. Liturgy unites art and reality in a supernatural childhood before God. To be at play or to fashion a work of art in God's sight, not to create, but to exist, such is the essence of a liturgy. More specifically, Gardini reminds the faithful, the practice of the liturgy means that by the help of grace, under the guidance of the church, we grow into living works of art before God, with no other aim or purpose than that of living and existing in his sight. It means fulfilling God's word and becoming his little children. It means foregoing maturity with all its purposefulness and confining oneself to play, as David did when he danced before the ark. Within liturgy, the soul is called to abandon the restlessness of purposeful activity and waste time for the sake of the Lord. Naturally, the correlative side uh, of liturgy is that it draws us closer to the Lord, and therefore it must be seen from the realm of salvation. Of its nature, however, it is for the sake of the Lord. We are to praise God, nothing more. In so doing, we continue to seek the truth in love, and therefore our final goal is the next life. As Benedict XVI further illustrates, 
The Eucharist cannot adequately be described as a meal. While Christ established the new reality of Christian worship within the framework of a Jewish Passover meal, it was the new reality, not the meal, that he commanded us to repeat. The Eucharist refers back to the cross and thus the transformation of temple sacrifice into worship of God. As Benedict states, the synagogue liturgy of the word renewed and deepened in a Christian way, merged with the remembrance of Christ's death and resurrection to become the Eucharist. Father Joseph Youngman has brought forth in his research that the notion of thanksgiving and sacrifice were dominant in the prayers within the liturgy of the early church. The liturgy is formulated as a prayer of thanksgiving, a sense of gratitude. Yet God has offered a gift which expresses our gratitude. Thus, as Youngman states, the sacrifice evolves from the prayer of thanks. The sacrifice is that of a mind wholly given to God, inner surrender, which evokes a sense of gratitude. The prayer of thanksgiving is such an appropriate garb for the Christian sacrifice, for this prayer expresses our thanksgiving for the salvation received through Christ. It must be uh, further be pointed out that the Eucharist is not a repetition of the Last Supper. As a Passover meal, it would have been celebrated yearly, whereas Eucharist in the early church, Revelations, Acts, 1 Corinthians, was celebrated weekly. While the Eucharist does take over substantial elements from the Passover tradition, the festal atmosphere, as seen in the passing of wine and the conditions of membership, is further, as Benedict states, is taken out of the Passover context and placed within the context of the Lord's Day. The day of resurrection becomes the matrix for the Lord's day. Benedict perceives the Eucharist as meal as a gross oversimplification. The Jewish meal exhibits basic characteristics arising from the fact that the meal itself was associated with a primary form of sacrifice, the ziba. The slaughter of animals could only take place at the altar. The eating of meat therefore pres presupposed a sacrificial context. The sacrificial character of the meal expressed a communion with God and a communion among the participants. One particular form of the ritual meal which played a prominent part in Judaism at the time of Christ was the toda, the thanksgiving sacrifice. The toda formed the cultic basis of the major part of the Psalter. The toda may be seen as a thank offering from death, fatal illness. What is celebrated is the restoration of life. Thus, within the Toda of Judaism, the person who had experienced deliverance provided the sacrificial animal for himself and the community. Within the context of Eucharist, the risen Lord has given himself. Because of its sacredness as a sacrifice, the food of the sacred meal, represented by the sacrificial bread, is the body of Christ. The bread does not signify the body of Christ in the metaphorical sense, in its very nature as a substance of the meal eaten in total sacrifice, it is the sacrifice of Christ himself. And so an inner unity of the Old and New Testaments is certainly brought to light with a deeper understanding of the toda as found within Judaism. Yet as Benedict has illustrated, an unprecedented clericalism has taken place for the priest has become the point of reference for the entire liturgy. In his apostolic exhortation, Sacramentum Caritatis, the pontiff cautions that any attempt at making, at making themselves a center of liturgical, liturgical action contradicts their identity as priests. The priest is above all a servant of others. He must continuously work toward being a sign that points to Christ. This need be given in his humility in leading liturgical assembly, in obedience to the right, uniting himself to it in mind and heart. People tried to reduce the role of the priest at this point of reference by assigning all kinds of liturgical functions to other people. Less and less is God in the picture. Benedict states rather boldly the dilemma we find with liturgy today. The turning of the priest toward the people has turned the community into a self-enclosed circle. In its outward form, 
it no longer opens out on what lies ahead and above, but is closed in on itself. The common turning uh, toward the east was not a celebration toward the wall. It did not mean that the priest had his back to the people. The priest himself was not regarded as so important. For just as the congregation in the synagogue looked toward Jerusalem, so in the Christian liturgy, the congregation looked toward the Lord. Looking, looking at the priest has no importance. What matters is looking toward the Lord. It is not now a question of dialogue, but of common worship. Some may question what a common turning toward the east would do to that which has so often been emphasized since Vatican II, that is, active participation. Does active participation necessarily mean something external? Benedict has reminded his readers that active participation has been falsely inter interpreted as external action. It is well again to revisit the Church of Antiquity to review an understanding of participation found there. As one may ascertain, active participation has taken on the posture within antiquity of praying with the priest. Pope Pius XII reminds us in his encyclical Mediatri Dei that the chief element in divine worship must be interior. We must always live in Christ and give ourselves to him completely so that in him, with him, and through him, the Heavenly Father may be duly glorified. The pontiff further reiterates that liturgy is the worship rendered by the mystical body of Christ in its entirety of its head and members. The distancing of the congregation from the priest in medieval times made this more difficult. Benedict's recent docu document, Samorum Pontificum, has made praying toward the east a viable option today, presuming an understanding of Latin and the facility of a celebrant. For those who do not see use of the 62 Missal as viable in their circumstance, one may note the prominence Benedict gives to the crucifix within the Eucharistic service. If one cannot pray toward the east, one can center one's attention on the crucifix, uh, which should be the central focus in relationship to the altar. The authorization given by Benedict allowing priests to celebrate the Tridentine Mass are from the Missal of uh, Pope Blessed John the 22nd, or what we know today is the extraordinary form, without permission of the local ordinary, has been seen by some as the pontiff's attempt to draw back to the church the followers of the former Archbishop Lefebvre. Yet in his motto proprio, Benedict has explained, the Roman Missal promulgated by Pope Paul VI is the ordinary expression of the Lex Arandi. The Roman Missal promulgated by St. Pius V and reissued by Blessed John XXIII is considered the extraordinary expression of that same Lex Arandi and must be given due honor to the venerable and ancient usage. Benedict perceives this reality as two usages of the one Roman rite, rather than a division in the church's lex credenti, the law of belief. However, it appears that the restoration of the practice is far deeper than that, bearing in mind the liturgical theology of Benedict. As the Pope has declared in his explanatory letter, a widespread return to the Tridentine Mass seems most unlikely in considering the fewness of priests who are trained in that ritual and the Latin language. That does not mean that priests cannot be trained or that the more conservative seminarians of this day might not wish to be trained. In fact, in his apostolic exhortation, uh, Sacramentum Caritatis, Benedict urges the use of, of Latin with the exception given to the readings, the homily, and the prayers of the faithful at international liturgical celebrations. In addition, he fosters the inclusion of selections in Gregorian chant, and as a matter of practice, the better known prayers of the church's tradition should be recited in Latin. He expresses the belief that future priests should be trained to celebrate the mass in Latin, use Latin texts, and execute Gregorian chant. 
In noting the celebration of the Eucharist, the pontiff wished to address the connection between Lex Orandi and Lex Credenti. The pontiff expressed a desire that the faithful experience the Eucharist as a mystery of faith celebrated authentically. The relationship between creed and worship is shown in a particular way by the rich theological and liturgical category of beauty. The truest beauty is the love of God conveyed in the Paschal mystery. It is through the liturgy that the truth of God's love in Christ encounters us, attracts us, and delights us, enabling us to emerge from ourselves and drawing us towards our true vocation, which is love. The beauty of the liturgy is an expression of God's glory. Beauty is therefore an essential element of a liturgical action. Much care is needed if liturgical action is to reflect its innate splendor. Benedict wishes, Benedict's wish is that every attempt should be, should be made to avoid any tension between the art of celebration, that is the art of proper celebration, and the full, active, fruitful participation of all the faithful. The Ars Celebrandi is the best way to ensure their actuosa participatio. It should be apparent from the writings of our present pontiff that he regards the liturgy as something living. He looks toward a constant growth and renewal of the liturgy in its reception and its finished form. He argues that the inner structural logic of the organism must be maintained. Thus, it is so important that the focus of a liturgy, a praise of the Lord in unison by the community be maintained, and that the basic core theology be seen as a mutual gift of congregation and the Lord to each other. It is with the appreciation of the gift that thanksgiving becomes paramount. Facing ease helps maintain that focus and core theology. Samorum Pontificum is certainly an opportunity to look again at the inner structural logic to see what further renewal the church might envision. As Benedict sees it, there should be an openness to development and continuity with the tradition in a proper balance. There further should be an awareness of the objective liturgical tradition and the care to ensure a substantial continuity. In respect to the liturgy, Benedict perceives his role as pontiff as one of obedience in faith. The imagery he calls upon is that of a gardener. The rite, that form of celebration and prayer, which has ripened in the faith and the life of the church, is a condensed form of living tradition in which the spear using that rite expresses the whole of its faith and its prayer, and thus at the same time, the fellowship of generations, one with another, becomes something we can experience, fellowship with the people who pray before us and after us. Thus the rite is something of benefit that is given to the church, a living form of paradosis, the handing on of tradition. Naturally, the difficulty comes with the interpretation of passing on the substantial continuity of tradition. Benedict calls upon one example of difficulty in interpretation and in pointing out that individuals have widely divergent views as to what is pastorally effective. At this point, creativity breaks in and the unity of liturgy is destroyed. If the lit liturgy appears, first of all, as the workshop for our activity, then what is essential is being forgotten, God. In his cover letter, Pope De Benedict refers to the many places celebrations were not faithful to the prescriptions of the new missal. The new missal was seen as authorizing or even requiring creativity, which frequently led to deformations of a liturgy, which were hard to bear. Benedict further states that he speaks from his own experience. This practice caused deep uh, pain to individuals totally rooted in the faith of the church. As stated earlier, the Roman Missal promulgated by Blessed John the 23rd was never abrogated. Therefore, ad orientum has always been possible. Our present 
and preceding pontiff had made this more apparent. Benedict XVI, in publishing the apostolic letter Samorum Pontificum, clarifies the celebration of the liturgy of, of the Roman Missal of 1962 on all days except the Easter Triduum. Benedict, therefore, brings to the forefront the practice of facing east. Now that the choice of practice of either liturgy has been leg legitimize, uh, legitimized and brought to the fore, we see that the faithful have, have the opportunity to get in touch with their own deepest yearn yearnings, to reflect how the liturgy for them might be best served as a praise and thanksgiving to the Lord and an inner enrichment to the flock. And thus we have the liturgical theology of Benedict XVI. Thank you. Anyone have a follow-up? Yes, <coughs> Sister. Um, I've really enjoyed your talk, first of all. Um, it seems like catechesis wouldn't necessarily be a huge factor in any kind of renewal that um, our Holy Father would be aiming towards, because a lot of the things that you're talking about, I think a lot of that theology most people are just really unfamiliar with, and that's why the practice of ad orientum or a number of other things might seem a little strange or unfamiliar to people. What do you think might be some practical kind of ways of um, making that sort of renewal take concrete reality? Now that we have the possibility excuse me, of praying ad orientum, uh, certainly if we are involved in catechesis of the young, I think it would be uh, to our benefit to expose the youth uh, to praying ad orientum. Uh, as we look in our diocese, there are a number of places which offer mass in that form. And uh, we, as uh, teachers, uh, could explain what the theology is behind that. So the possibility is certainly there. It's also interesting uh, to note this um, presentation was given at a seminary. It was an eight-year seminary. It is an eight-year seminary. And um, the seminarians were quite interested in the topic. So it, it appears that there's a good bit of interest among uh, men who are in the seminary today uh, in this form of, of praying the liturgy, of celebrating Mass, and it's possible that it may become more frequent in the future. Naturally, a lot of people will say, uh, well, I don't want the, to go to Mass with the priest uh, having his back to me, uh, but again, as you say, uh, it is because there is not an understanding of the theology behind it. So I would think that we as uh, teachers, if we are involved in that, would have a responsibility to, to expose them uh, to what is there and why it is there. I think it's also important uh, that Benedict is looking at the element of tradition. And he's saying that it got a little bit twisted along the way. And he is trying to create a greater clarity uh, in reference to why this tradition has existed for so many years and uh, certainly making the focus of the liturgy the good Lord himself. Never was it intended that it be otherwise, but we know that it is more difficult when we face each other, and as it's said here, uh, a community can become turned in on itself. There's also the element of unity in reference to language. Um, we are looking at Latin. You might recall the incident several years ago uh, when John Paul was in Denver, he whispered to one of uh, the deacons at the uh, mass in Denver uh, that he wanted everyone to pray, he wanted the youth to pray uh, the Our Father in Latin because he thought that would be a unifying factor and the deacon whispered back to him, they don't know the Our Father in Latin. Um, and so that was the end of that idea. Uh, and so, you know, uh, as uh, we see Benedict here is saying, uh, wouldn't it be well if we even knew the basic prayers of the church in Latin as a kind of unifying factor. Um, we who uh, travel and we are so connected by way of communication, it would be well if we at least had some unifying elements within the church. Mm -hmm. And Latin has been that unifying element in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sister, for a, a just a wonderful 
uh, an edifying talk. Oh, yeah. When I became Catholic, uh, when I converted to the Catholic Church in 1992, um, I loved everything I found, but the single most difficult thing to get used to was adjusting to the disorienting effect of priest and people facing opposite directions yes. mm -hmm. at Mass. I'd been Anglican before, so I was always used to ad orientum celebration, and I'm delighted to hear uh, the Church Catholics reconsidering mm -hmm. um, uh, celebration versus populum. And mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people aren't aware that uh, the celebrant assuming the eastward position is possible even in the ordinary form. Yes. Uh, the, the vernacular version of the Novus Ordo yes. Mass. And I was very gratified to hear recently that uh, Bishop Edward Slattery in Tulsa uh, has decreed that all of his own Masses celebrated in his own cathedral will be celebrated ad orientum in the mm -hmm. ordinary form. To what degree do you think it's going to require not only catechesis and papal example, but Episcopal leadership to kind of show the way, hmm. um, even uh, in the ordinary form? I can't answer that question. Uh, uh, I don't know that there is a lot of Episcopal leadership in this country as of now. Uh, that's just a very honest answer. Um, whether it will come in the future remains to be seen. Uh, but I do think it's interesting that uh, we are seeing a, a number of, of young men in seminaries who uh, are uh, very much open to this possibility. There are also some uh, religious orders of men who use only this rite. And so uh, I heard recently that um, Cardinal DiNardo said uh, he had an offer from a religious order to come into the diocese and uh, use this right only, and Cardinal DiNardo's response was he didn't think that that was necessary at this point. Uh, maybe that would change in the future. Uh, but we, um, we certainly see that there is somewhat of an interest among the young. Um, the bishops, I, I really don't know that I can answer that at the moment. Father Kirk? Uh, it is, I'm one of the old priests that knows how to do it the other way. The first the Great, first, it's wonderful. The first 16, <laughs> the first 16 years, the uh, extraordinary form was the only one that we were permitted. So I, I have no trouble with that. Um, I do think that the Second Vatican Council expressed a view that some improvement of the uh, right of the Eucharist was desirable. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm a little bit uncomfortable with uh, in my at least once a week and usually twice a week I celebrate in the extraordinary form. But the people that for whom I do it seem to uh, be extremely desirous that nothing from 1962 be changed. Hmm. That all of the, the many, many signs of the cross, hmm. uh, the rather uh, busy form of the, of the doxology at the end of the Eucharistic prayer be exactly the way it was in 1962. And I'm a little uneasy that this may represent a reluctance to accept the decision of the council, an ecumenical council of the Catholic Church, the universal church, that some, uh, some reform of the liturgy was desirable. This is not Pope Benedict's problem. He talks about reform of the reform, not of going back to 1962. But it seems to me that most of the people for whom I celebrate the extraordinary form don't want any change whatever. No fewer signs of the cross, no fewer genuflections, no fewer repetitions of the confidio or the uh, Domini non sum dignus or whatever. So we still have a ways to go, is that what we're saying? <laughs> yeah, we still have a ways to go, yes, okay. Uh, and, and so um, Father Kirker's point is well taken. When we were looking at uh, some changes within the liturgy in Vatican II, and certainly some necessary changes came about, and we could look at simplifications of the 62 rite, uh, and that does not mean that we go back to the exact rite as it was, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to follow up from what uh, Father Kirker has said. 
Uh, you several times invoked the notion of a clerical distancing, uh, speaking in general about medieval practice. And I think what his uh, observations suggest is that within the uh, right, which we're calling the 1962 right, we have clerical distancing in the reality of the right itself, not simply in the orientation of priest and people. And that, to a very great degree, what you're calling, what the council called actuosa participatio, uh, has to do not so much with kind of everybody doing everything, but uh, this deeper sense of what this, the movement, the dynamism of the Eucharist itself is about. And you can't even talk about nostalgia for 1962, because certainly m most of the people uh, who are attending these celebrations uh, are not re recalling elements from their youth. Yeah. I'm old enough mm -hmm. to Well, let me ask you about this then. Uh, what about the Muslims who always practice, uh, pray in the same direction towards Mecca? Do you think there's any parallel? To pray, Christians, Catholics pray, pray in east, to the east. Uh, praying east uh, is is found in a number of religions. It's not just um, Christianity, as I mentioned. It's in Judaism. You do find uh, uh, praying toward a Mecca. That's true also because it's a site of origin, um, and to a certain extent, you can say praying east has to do with Jerusalem, in the sense of the place where Jesus walked, but also. We could look at Jerusalem in re reference to Judaism, the site of the temple. So it has to do with origins. Uh, but for a Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, we look at uh, the references in reference to the Old Testament itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that when the year 2000 came about, uh, so many people went to Jerusalem and uh, hunkered down, uh, waiting for the second coming of Christ. And it was in Jerusalem that they went, and of course they were greatly disappointed. Um, but it was that idea, you know, that Christ was going to come again from the east. Other questions? Sister, my home parish, um, the altar does not face east. Like if you're facing the altar, you're facing west or something. Do you think if you're celebrating it in the current rite, if the priest is still like with his back to the people, um, do, do you think there's still that, the, the benefit of facing east, even though like he's not facing east? Again, facing east has a scriptural connotation to it, but you, if you recall, Benedict's overall theology is the awareness of the thrust in prayer toward God. And so liturgy is meant to be a praise and thanksgiving, uh, as it mentions there, a kind of sacrificial thanksgiving as the priest and community offer that together. Uh, so yes, in the mind of Benedict, uh, the entire focus uh, of facing the same direction uh, would be seen as very beneficial. And if you remember in this rendition, uh, Benedict also gives emphasis to the crucifix uh, because of the element of sacrifice as we see within uh, the Eucharist itself. Mm -hmm.